So thank you so much for the invitation to present this evening and thank you to all of the clients and the attendees that have decided to join us for this evening. Um, I'm hoping that through this seminar, I can kind of explain a little bit about the radiation oncology service and kind of what experiences pets have when they come to see the service and kind of through sharing a little bit more about the workflow in radiation oncology. I'm hoping that that kind of gives clients the confidence to know that radiation therapy may be an option to consider consider in the future. Not that we necessarily want to see your pet for, you know, a diagnosis of cancer, but we're here to help and we hope that you feel really comfortable with the care that we provide. And so as we go through this, I'm just going to minimize this. Um, I do like to start with a couple of learning objectives. And the reason for this is that the basis for this seminar is really trying to address these three questions. And so I'm hoping that by the end of this, you'll have a better idea of the general area in which radiation therapy might fit into the treatment paradigm for a pet with cancer. I'm not gonna go through all of the different examples for where we would use radiation therapy, but just generally to describe where we might use radiation therapy and the general themes in which radiation therapy may May be the mainstay of treatment. We're going to kind of walk through what happens when a pet gets, gets um, recommended for radiation therapy. And through this, we're kind of going to walk through several steps that will describe different ways that we can deliver radiation therapy, all of the checks and balances that go into making sure that when we give radiation therapy, it's the best possible plan we can create for the pet's tumor. And then what a typical workflow and day is like for a radiation patient here at the University of Minnesota. So it's only 40 minutes, so it's hard to go through everything in 40 minutes, but I'm hoping to give you a little bit of taste of the taste of what a pet's experience here is like. So oncologists, we really like rules and guidelines, and we sometimes break these rules and guidelines, but we tend to stick with general cancer treatment principles. And some of the basic principles are really that we tend to treat localized disease with localized therapies. And our local therapies are typically things like surgical resection or radiation therapy. And these are really treatments that are aimed at trying to control a local tumor. So that could be something like a soft tissue sarcoma that affects a dog, an injection site sarcoma that affects a cat, or a mast cell tumor that affects either species. In most of these cases, we really know that these diseases tend to behave in more of a localized fashion. And so we wanna remove that mass at that local site. There are other types of tumors like lymphoma that arise in multiple different locations. And these are often considered systemic diseases, meaning that they can affect multiple different organs. So treating just one or two treatment sites or tumor sites with radiation therapy or surgery generally doesn't give us really good long-term control. And so the classic really is that lymphoma, kind of the standard of care is to use chemotherapy or either oral or injectable chemotherapy drugs that basically get into the system and have access to multiple tissues to try and kill tumor cells in multiple locations. And then for some tumors, they'll have both. They'll both cause local invasion and create a local disease process, but some tumors have also have a high propensity to spread or metastasize to other sites like a lymph node or a lung. And so in these cases, we may actually use a, a multimodality approach where we may use surgery and radiation therapy or just radiation therapy to try to get really good local control and then chemotherapy to try and help prevent or minimize the spread of tumor cells to other locations. So we generally tend to stick to these principles. And radiation therapy will kill tumor cells when it's kind of the target of the radiation field. And if we look at the evolution of radiation therapy over the last 70 years, incredible advances have been made in not only the technology that is able to give radiation, but also in the software that's available to plan radiation. And one of the primary goals with radiation therapy is obviously that we want to kill tumor cells and we want to kill as many tumor cells as we possibly can. But radiation therapy is also not benign. Radiation can kill tumor cells, but it can also injure normal cells. And so while our primary goal is really to try and kill as many tumor cells as possible, we have to be cognizant that there's sometimes 
sensitive tissue that sits next to tumor. And we really don't want to try and kill those cells as well, right? Everything we want to do is about maintaining quality of life and getting as much quality of life as we can for as long as we can. And so if we look at this evolution of radiation therapy in human oncology, we have really followed a similar path in veterinary oncology. They may have started a little bit earlier, um, but we now have a lot of these new technologies that we can offer here. And so if you kind of look at the evolution, we'll talk about these in more detail as the seminar uh, progresses. So we have kind of this non-sophisticated conventional 2D radiation that was really the start of radiation. And it's actually how I was trained as a resident uh, 15, 16 years ago now, where we basically just had a point and shoot system. We would see a tumor, we would design maybe one or two radiation fields, and we would kind of beam on and give radiation. We didn't do a whole lot of shaping, and we really just couldn't do much about any normal tissue that was sitting next to the tumor. From their uh, conformal radiation therapy, which they've labeled conventional 3D radiation therapy, really became the mainstay of treatment. And this actually involves getting 3D information. And we get this information about every pet or every patient um, by getting three-dimensional imaging from CT images or MRI images. And this actually gives us a great example of how extensive the tumor is, what normal tissue is sitting next to that tumor. And we can actually better shape radiation beams to better target the tumor and limit radiation dose off to the side where sensitive structures might sit. From there, we've actually really advanced planning and radiation delivery, and we can actually harness really powerful computer systems to actually even better modulate the radiation beam to better treat the tumor and limit normal tissue dose. And that's really where intensity modulated radiation therapy has fit in. It's great for really irregularly shaped tumors that have really sensitive structures that sit next to a tumor. And this will make a little bit more sense as we go through, but these, the CRT and IMRT are really kind of the mainstay of treatment that we offer here. So the majority of our patients will get one of those two types of treatments. And radiation oncologists, we love acronyms. So we know that it's really confusing to say, well, there's 2D RT and CRT and IMRT. Um, so I'm hoping that this kind of clarifies that a lot of this is on our end to determine what's best for the pet that needs to be treated. And then I did want to mention that stereotactic body radiation therapy, or SABER, which is stereotactic ablative body radiation therapy, offers a really new way of treatment. And with these types of treatments, which we've really only offered here in the last two or three years, um, we're giving tumors really high doses of radiation less frequently. Um, so this is kind of an exciting new way of giving radiation therapy. It's not suitable for every pet, but it has become certainly more popular. Um, and people really like this option, particularly if they have to travel a really long distance to an oncology center. So we'll kind of walk through those four different options. So most radiation treatments are given with a linear accelerator in veterinary medicine. Um, it's very rare to find older units. There may be some still around to treat veterinary patients, but not many. Um, and what I'm showing you here is a cartoon depiction of the inside workings of a linear accelerator on your left and our linear accelerator on the right as it's moving. So it's moving from one side to another. And these are all gantry angles um, that we can use for treating the pet. And this machine is capable of rotating 360 degrees around this couch top. And this couch top is where our pet patient would sit. And this machine will rotate all the way around the pet. So the pet only needs to sit in one, hopefully very comfortable position for treatment. On the left, it's actually showing what's happening inside the head of this machine. So up here, we have electrons that are accelerated very fast down a tube. They'll hit a metal target. And that actually generates really high energy photons that are coming out of the bottom of the machine or the head of the machine. So they come out right through here to treat the patients. So these are really high energy x-rays. These are very different than what you would have 
done at like a dental x-ray or if you were having any kind of a lung x-ray for screening. Those are really low energy x-rays. They're really not designed to kill cells. They're really designed to kind of absorb differentially in the body. These are incredibly high energy x-rays that interact with tissue very differently. What's also really great about this equipment is that it comes with really advanced software. Um, and we'll get into a little bit about some, what some of that software can let us do. So we're kind of gonna start our number of steps that would occur when a pet is referred to radiation oncology here. So right now, radiation oncology is still pretty small at the University of Minnesota, and we're ancillary to our medical oncology service. Um, and our medical oncology service is kind of the heart and soul of all of the oncology group, and we're a really large group here. But right now, all of the radiation patients are kind of part of this integrated team. And so when, we're, when a patient is referred for radiation oncology, I'm kind of working in the background and there's a huge team of people that are working up front. And we are all an integrated group. We communicate every day and we make sure that all of the pets seeing oncology, regardless of if it's medical oncology or radiation oncology or surgical oncology, you know, we're all kind of in the mix talking about the cases in the most appropriate approach Approaches to take for these for these pets. So you may see a number of the veterinarians that have advanced training in oncology or are going through advanced training in oncology. We have a big team of certified veterinary technicians. This group on the left really focuses on medical oncology, which could be um, helping with diagnostic tests that we need to help figure out what we think a tumor is going to do, what types of treatments we might offer. These technicians also focus on the administration of chemotherapy or immunotherapy. And then we have a group of radiation therapy technicians who uh, work with me to make sure that all the radiation treatments go according to plan. But we're all part of one big, large integrated team. We've also just recently been lucky enough to acquire a technician assistant, and she helps to make sure that the day flows according to plan. So ultimately, you'll meet with one of the veterinarians when you come in for an initial consult. Um, and really what our job that day is to figure out what type of tumor are we going to be dealing with? What do we expect this tumor to be doing? Do we need any additional tests to make sure that we know what recommendations to make? And then we want to arm you with as much information as we possibly can. Our goal is really to educate clients and educate referring veterinarians on what options we may have available. We're not trying to choose a path forward for you, but we're trying to help you make a decision that best fits with you, your family, and your pet. And so a lot of our information is available on the website. Um, I'll show you kind of what that looks like at the end of the seminar. But one of the things we try to do is collect all the information we think might help you be prepared ahead of time, so ahead of the visit. And over the last few years, the radiation therapy technicians have um, taken a lot of the same questions and we've created a frequently asked questions document that is, is uploaded on the website. And this has a lot of information about radiation therapy that can help you get very comfortable with um, kind of the workflow here and what you expect. We also tend to give you lots of information, sometimes overload information about the tumor type and the different therapeutic options that day. One of the most important things once we decide that radiation therapy may be a good treatment choice for the pet um, is to figure out what would be the role of radiation therapy in the treatment paradigm. And we kind of divide this up into two kind of major groups. One is that we need to decide if radiation therapy is going to be definitive in its intent. And this is sometimes called curative intent. And what this means is that we're trying to get the best chance at long-term tumor control. It does not always mean that we will cure the tumor, but we are going to try our best to cure the tumor, or at least reduce the tumor to as few a number of cells as possible to make sure that the quality of life for the pet is as good as it can be, and we can extend that outcome um, one of the other major important factors for definitive intent radiation therapy is that we really don't want to cause any harm. Um, so some of our patients will live for years after radiation therapy. And again, we know that a lot of sensitive structures will sometimes sit next to a tumor. We really don't want to cause any harm to those structures because of radiation therapy. 
So the other big group is palliative intent radiation therapy. And in this case, we're actually just trying to improve quality of life. We typically use a lower dose of radiation. It's fewer number of treatments. And our goal here is really to try and get a quick treatment in that might actually help to reduce ulceration or pain. Sometimes it will temporarily reduce tumor growth. And it's really just about a, a short-term improvement in quality of life. We're not trying to kill as many tumor cells as we can to try and get that long-term tumor control. And it's really vital that we figure out kind of what our goals are, what the client's goals are, so that we can make a good path forward. Just like in other areas of medicine, a prescription is given with radiation therapy. Um, but instead of using a term like a milligram, we use the term called a gray. And this is a way of measuring how much radiation energy is absorbed in that tumor. And our different radiation prescriptions are in part dependent on the goals of treatment, what the tumor characteristics are, how likely is a tumor to respond to radiation, what is the normal tissue that's next to the tumor, how sensitive is that tissue next to the tumor, and does the patient maybe have any comorbidities like heart disease or kidney disease that might play a role in what we decide to prescribe. And a typical definitive intent protocol, meaning we're trying to treat a tumor and get the best chance at long-term control, will typically use a protocol that's very similar to a lot of human oncology protocols. So something like a breast carcinoma protocol or historical prostate tumor treatment. So for example, we might give 20 fractions or 20 treatments of 2.5 gray of radiation per day to a total dose of 50 gray to the tumor. So that's a pretty high dose of radiation, and this is where we're really trying to kill as many tumor cells as we can. A typical palliative intent protocol here would be five fractions or five treatments of four gray of radiation given per day to a total dose of only 20 gray to the tumor. So you can see that the total dose is very different and the intent is very different with these protocols. And this will become important when we talk about some of the normal tissue that's near the tumor. So if we have a tumor that's sitting next to critical structures, we always have to pay attention to what that total dose is that that normal tissue can safely receive. So we say that the normal tissue or the organs are dose limiting. We can kill almost anything with radiation. We want to kill as many tumor cells as possible, but if we damage the heart or damage the liver while we're trying to treat the tumor, that could actually upend our, our entire goal. And so what I'm showing you here is a CT image, and it's just one section of a CT image. And you'll see several of these throughout the rest of the seminar. So I'm going to orient you a little bit to this CT image. Um, so on this particular, this is a dog with a rib tumor. And on this particular dog, the head of this dog is over here on your left. The tail of this dog is over here on your right. CT images are basically a way to take 2D images and it reconstructs it into a three-dimensional image. And I'm basically taking a section kind of halfway through the dog from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. And I'm only showing you the chest cavity. The different colors in here represent different tissue. So anything that's black is lung, anything that is white like this is bone. So this is part of a rib of a dog. And then there are these gradations of gray that represent different soft tissues. So here's kind of a darker gray that represents fat that's sitting under the skin. And this is a darker gray that, or a lighter gray that represents muscle. And then here I've outlined the heart, the liver, the stomach and the lung for you, just to show you that the proximity can be very close to a tumor. And what I'm showing you with these really pretty colors right here is what's called a dose color wash. And this is actually a way for us to to take a picture and look at what the radiation dose distribution is on this particular tumor. And the way to look at this is that these cooler colors, the blue and the purple, and even the green out here, represent lower doses of radiation. These warmer colors, this orange and this red, represent higher doses of radiation. And this is exactly what we want to see. We want to see that those warmer colors are right around our tumor and that we really don't have high radiation doses going anywhere into the normal structures. In some cases, we're not this lucky where we have our heart and our liver and our stomach and our lung mostly spared from radiation. And so what we can do in these cases is fractionate. 
And what fractionation means is that we're taking that overall dose of radiation that we want to give to a tumor and we're dividing it up into smaller doses. And this is where we come up with some of our definitive protocols where I know I want to give 50 gray to the tumor, but I know that the lung can't tolerate 50 gray all at once. So I have to split that up so that I can give smaller doses and allow that normal tissue to actually tolerate that dose. And so this is really fractionation in order to try and allow normal tissue to repair those little radiation injuries that it takes every day. Tumor can also repair radiation injury if we give it every day and kind of give that break between treatments. But tumor is kind of fickle. It's really busy trying to figure out how to divide and how to grow more and how to migrate into other structures. It doesn't really want to waste much time repairing radiation damage. Normal tissue is much more efficient at repairing radiation injury. And so just by splitting it up by every day and giving a small dose, that radiation injury builds up in the tumor, but we're letting that normal tissue really recover between each treatment. So this is really important because the fractionation becomes important later on. The larger the radiation dose that's given to a normal tissue, it's going to increase the likelihood that will cause more permanent injury to that tissue. And so if we're really worried about, let's say, a heart or a lung dose, we might not want to give a really big dose of radiation per treatment. And so how do we know that particular tumor types are even going to respond to radiation? And this is all really information that we discussed with you at that very first visit. Um, we want to make sure that the client's expectation match our expectations. Um, obviously, we're not always right. So we know that a lot of tumors are radiation responsive, but some dogs and cats don't respond the way that we expect them to. So we can talk in generalities, but ultimately we know that we can always be surprised by treatment. And so while we generally will list our, yes, this is a really radio responsive tumor to it, mm, we're concerned that these tumors maybe don't have the best response. We always have outliers. And these are the discussions we have with you up front that, you know, are, are you the type of client that at the end of the day you want to try everything to give your pet the best chance at local control or maybe you're just primarily concerned about improving quality of life even if it's only for a couple of months and again this is all about setting expectations so in terms of radiation response, we have a growing body of literature that helps us determine what types of protocols to use and what situations to use radiation therapy. But it's very uncommon that we wouldn't consider radiation at some point in a pet's treatment. And in human radiation oncology, greater than 50% of cancer patients will now be prescribed or recommended to consider radiation therapy in over 50% of those patients. Um, and that's probably similar in our patients as well. It's just that radiation facilities are not as widely available for pets as they are for people. But the reality is radiation therapy is likely to play a role at some point in many different tumor types. And just to give you a couple of examples, now that we've talked about definitive intent and palliative intent, um, I wanted to give you a couple of pictures. So I've got two dogs to show you. This is a dog that has lymphoma of her tongue. Um, and so while I just presented lymphoma as typically a systemic disease, so it's typically a disease that arises in multiple sites and chemotherapy is generally the standard of care. There are always exceptions to those rules. And lymphoma can on occasion be a local or focal disease where it doesn't affect any other site and just affects one site. Lymphoma is exquisitely sensitive to radiation. So we get really excited when we see a lymphoma that's limited to one spot because we think we can do an excellent job at gaining long-term control with definitive intent radiation. And in this dog, you can see that there's ulcerative and nodular lesions all on the dorsal surface of this tongue or the top surface of this tongue. And even by the last radiation treatment, all of those lesions are gone. So this is over a four week period of daily radiation therapy, Monday through Friday with the weekends off. 
You can see that the tongue is kind of shiny. So that is an acute radiation effect from radiation to the normal tongue. So it's kind of like burning the roof of your mouth with a hot slice of pizza or a hot coffee or a hot, hot chocolate. You kind of get that raw feeling on the roof of your mouth. It will heal really quickly. Um, and generally speaking, side effects like this heal spontaneously relatively quickly. By relatively quickly, I mean typically within five to seven days of their peak in severity. So that's really an example of where we can gain long-term control. And most of the cases of lymphoma where we can treat focally, we're aiming for one to three years of really good quality control. What this means is we don't have to give chemotherapy in this instance, and we can save it for if we need it in the future. We're not giving a local disease a systemic treatment that could cause systemic side effects. The nice thing about radiation is that it really, if it's going to cause effects, is only going to cause effects in the irradiated field. We're not expecting things like nonspecific signs such as vomiting, diarrhea, or inappetence. So this is another dog with a tongue tumor, a different type of tongue tumor. So this is a hemangiosarcoma on the bottom surface of the tongue. And in this case, these tumors tend to cause a lot of ulcerations and bleeding. Um, and in this instance, this owner selected palliative intent radiation therapy to just try and improve this dog's comfort and ability to eat. Um, and this dog was actually treated once a week for four treatments. So it didn't come to see us very often. This is what the lesion looked like on the first treatment. So you can see how uncomfortable this might be for this dog. Um, and even by the last radiation treatment, this is just a palliative intent low dose radiation treatment. You can see that it's markedly improved. Um, there's still tumor in here. This is still not normal, um, but we can palliate the clinical signs and improve quality of life in these instances. So we arm you with all this information on that first visit. Um, some clients really are well prepared to come in. They know exactly what they want to do. And we make the decision that day to pursue radiation therapy. In some other instances, clients want to go home and think about things. And again, ultimately, our goal is to educate the client so that they can make a decision they're really comfortable with. Um, we never want a, a client to choose a treatment path and then say, I really regret choosing that path. Um, we try to encourage you to kind of look forward and anything we can do to make you comfortable with that decision up front um, really needs to happen before therapy. We don't want you second guessing things as you go through treatment. But once a decision has been made to pursue either definitive intent or palliative intent radiation therapy, our radiation oncology team gets a request for radiation, and that's when the fun kind of starts on our end. Um, so for every pet that gets radiation therapy here at Minnesota, a bespoke or a unique radiation plan is made for each pet. Um, and one of the most important principles for us, right, is that we want to make sure that we treat the tumor with as much radiation dose as possible, and we want to minimize the amount of dose going to normal structures. So that means that if we're going to make a plan for a patient, we need that patient to be in the same position every single treatment. We're not just doing one radiation treatment. We may be doing up to 20, potentially more than 20 treatments. Um, but even as low as five treatments, we need to make sure that the tumor or the tumor site is where we need it to be for treatment. So this really re uh, requires us to create a reproducible reproducible position. And I'm showing you a couple of images of how we do that here. So one is that we've got a customized bite blocking system that's actually designed just for our service. Um, we're really privileged here at Minnesota to work with the Department of Radiation Oncology at the medical school. And their medical physics group who checks all of the radiation plans, helps to create some of the radiation plans for human patients. They also help us over here. Um, and they're radiation oncologists who are in involved in making protocols. They also help us with our patients to make sure that we're really offering the, the most advanced state-of-the-art radiation therapy we can possibly provide. And so this is actually a 3D bite blocking system that's unique to our system um, that fits on a CT table. So it's kind of fixed here and it can't move. And then I'll show you how we create a little dental mold for every dog so, and cat so that they basically go into this position each time at the exact same location. And that helps us to make sure that the tumor is in the right position. This is great for head and neck tumors. For tumors that are in other locations on the body, so here's a tumor on a limb, 
This is a dog with an anal sac tumor that we're going to do post-operative treatment in. We use these vacuum formable mattresses. And these mattresses you can fill with air and you can conform them around the body and then suck all of the air out. And so it creates these positioning spots that we can actually put the patient back in in that exact same spot. And you can see here, we're making marks on these backlock mattresses to say, hey, the right foot goes here, the ankle goes here, the tail goes here. And this helps us ensure that the pet is in the correct position at each visit. So why do we need to do this reproducible positioning at the simulation? Well, the majority of our patients actually get a CT-based radiation plan. And so we will do a CT scan that's called a CT simulation that lets us get this image in gets this imaging so that we can create this unique plan. So here again is a dog that's on our customized bite blocking system. So this locks onto the table and can't move. That gives us the security to the couch top so that we can actually create a customized dental mold up for every patient. Um, and it's great because cats and dogs usually have very sharp canines. And so it can create these really great dental spots that the dog, will, dog or cat will come back into. It's just like what you would have have made if you saw your dentist and they were making you a retainer um, or any kind of other um, system needing a mold of your mouth. Obviously, this cannot be used for any other pet. Um, it's unique to this particular pet, and we give these to owners if they want to take them home at the end of treatment. What we'll then do once we get our positioning the way that we want it is we'll actually take these cross sections with a CT scan. So essentially this pet will move into the CT scanner and we collect these images at one or two millimeter in, uh, intervals throughout the structure of interest. And so to orient you, I'm showing you again, two more CT scans here on the right. Um, this one is actually oriented in the same direction as this dog. And um, so over here is the tip of the nose, back here is the brain, the lower jaw is sitting here. And this kind of gray structure right here is this dental mold where you can see that the teeth are actually embedded into this dental mold. And this is what gives us really, again, that security that fixes to the couch top. Now, normally the nasal cavity, which is right here, should be air filled. So anything that's black is air, anything that's white is bone. Um, but in this case, there's a large tumor that's occupying the nasal cavity. What we actually do with these CT images is we look at the slices like this. So we're actually now just taking a slice this way from left to right, and we're looking at a cross-sectional image. And as a radiation oncologist, I might get 100 to 200 different images like this all the way in different sections through this. Every single image is evaluated, and I outline where the tumor is and where the normal structures are. And this becomes really important when we make the plan. Not only does it give me a really good idea for how extensive is this tumor, which orientation am I going to need the beams to come from, but it also lets me see what the sensitive structures are and where they're sitting and where I might run into problems. So for example, in this particular dog's case, this is the right eye and this is what a normal eye should look like. In this case, there's a large maxillary tumor right here. So this is very abnormal and it's actually causing the eye to be compressed and moved out of its normal position. This is gonna be really important for me because I'm gonna to have to figure out what I'm gonna do if the eye moves back into a normal position. So it's really vital to get these images up front. Once I have all of those images contoured, so basically I'm, I'm not an artist, I have no creative bones, but this is the one time I get to use colors and I basically get to draw in all of the CT scans where my tumor is and where my normal tissue is. I then can actually go to the computer planning system and say, all right, I'm gonna start creating some beams. And I'll have radiation beams oriented in different directions around the pet. Um, and typically we'll have somewhere in the realm of five to eight radiation beams that we're directing towards a tumor. And this is unique for a conformal radiation therapy plan. So kind of that baseline mainstay of treatment until a couple of years ago. 
So what happens in a conformal radiation therapy plan is that we, we angle these beams towards the tumor, and then I go in and I individually shape how each beam is, is shaped. And what I can do in those instances is if I have a beam coming from the top of a dog and then from the bottom of a dog, I can actually change where the aperture is. So if I have an eye, I can block the eye from both directions. I then basically calculate what the beams are doing. And the CT data that I have actually has how dense the tissue is. So bone is very dense compared to things like fat and muscle. And that's gonna change the way that radiation dose kind of builds up in the, in the pet. So what I can do is calculate and then look to see how does that dose conform to the tumor? Is it really tightly shaped around the tumor or is it kind of going everywhere? Is there anywhere that I can narrow that in? I'm also looking at this point at what normal tissue is receiving radiation dose. Am I comfortable with that dose going to that organ or do I need to maybe back off on the dose? If I don't like the plan, I'll go back and reshape the beams, recalculate it and evaluate it again. It's very much a trial and error process and this takes time to do. So an example of this is in this cartoon. So if this is an irregular tumor volume right here, this kind of figure eight brown or red sort of structure, depending on if you're somewhat colorblind, um, this is going to be our tumor volume. And I have three radiation beams that are directed towards this irregular tumor volume. I can shape these beams to some degree, and then I can calculate it. And this yellow color that's outside of my irregular target volume is my target radiation dose. That's my prescription dose that I want to go to my tumor. So I'm covering the tumor pretty well. And this is great for a large number of tumors. If I have any sensitive structures or tissues out here, I'm really not giving those structures significant dose. So I would be happy with this plan. So how do I shape the beams? What I'm showing you here is called a multi-leaf collimator. So this is the head of the machine that you're looking at. So the head of the gantry and my high energy photons are gonna come out from here. We actually have a built-in system that consists of these leaves and these leaves can move individually. So you can see how I'm able to create several different irregular shapes. This is how I can actually shape the radiation beams to the tumor target itself. So each of these beams or each of these leaves as they come in, they'll actually block whatever's underneath it. So depending on the gantry angle, so I'm coming you know, from potentially 360 degrees around the pet, I can drag these leaves over sensitive structures and leave the tumor open. And that lets the radiation dose build up in the tumor while limiting the radiation dose to the normal structures next to that. So intensity modulated radiation therapy is something that we rolled out here about three, four years ago now. Um, and every year we kind of increase the percentage of patients that we treat with IMRT. And this is one of the most exciting advances that we've been able to have for veterinary medicine. And I'll walk you through why that is. So in this case, this is kind of a step forward from conformal radiation. So we're still directing multiple beams towards a tumor. But in this case, I'm actually using computer power to actually figure out what's the best possible way for the beams to be shaped. Not only can I have more than six to eight beams now, um, the computer actually can run through thousands of different iterations um, in the span of several minutes where it would take me weeks to do those same iterations as, a, as one human. So I'm really taking advantage of computer power to actually say, all right, I really want my tumor to get dose X and I really don't want this I that's right next to this tumor to get dose Y. The computer can then calculate what the best situation is. And then typically I'm ending, I, I get a result where the radiation dose is tightly conforming to tumor. So I'm conforming to the tumor in both situations, but in this case, I'm really tightly conforming to that tumor. So it's really great for tumors that have a, a really clear start and stop really clear, well-delineated edges. So if I use that same cartoon, we still have that same irregularly shaped tumor volume here. I still have these three radiation beams that are aimed here, um, but what I can do is change the intensity of radiation at this point. Um, and that's allowing the radiation to be very tightly conformal. So if I have a sensitive structure sitting out here, I can now reduce the dose of radiation where I wasn't able to do that with a conformal plan. 
So IMRT is really great for irregularly shaped tumors like nasal tumors in cats and dogs. Um, typically they sit you know, right next to the eyes, right next to the brain. And so we always struggle to really give a high dose to tumor yet spare those structures. IMRT is not always great for every tumor. Um, and ultimately what I do as the radiation oncologist is I may run several different plans. Ultimately, I'm trying to come up with a plan that's suitable for each pet. So a plan might look something like this. So this is another example of a CT image. Again, anything that is air is black, anything that is white is bone. So this is the back of the jaw. This is the skull right here. So the bones of the skull. And then this is the brain in here. And so this is an irregular brain tumor that's sitting kind of midpoint in the brain. And we have nine different radiation beams that are aimed towards this tumor. And I can actually change how many beamlets are coming from each of these beams. And ultimately I can end up with something like 90 or hundred different um, beamlets. And then this again is just showing you that same color wash. So you've seen this a couple times now, but I just wanted to kind of reiterate that this dose color wash is a nice way of picturing how much radiation dose is going to the tumor and how much is going to the normal tissue. And this is ultimately what we want to see where the normal tissues are really not taking significant dose. We sometimes don't know how to predict what toxicity will be until the radiation plan is done. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, for nasal tumors in cats and dogs, we can give you gen general information about acute toxicity or late toxicity, but it's not until the plan is done that we really know that for that particular pet, um, we've done a great job at reducing the likelihood of any injury to normal tissue. So then what's different about SVRT or SRT? Um, this is certainly a really hot topic. Certainly in veterinary medicine, this has increased in um, owner interest and veterinarian interest in the last five years and more facilities are able to do this now. So stereotactic body radiation therapy um, simply refers to high doses of radiation therapy that are given infrequently to just a gross tumor when it's given outside of the brain. Stereotactic radiation therapy is the same idea, same principle. We're giving a really high radiation dose to a small tumor target that's in the brain. Um, the only difference is the location, but we're still only doing this a couple of times. So where I've given you the example of kind of the conventional fractionation or 20 treatments of a low dose of radiation every day. In this instance, we're actually only giving three to five treatments, but we're giving four or five times that low radiation dose at each treatment. So it's really, really important in these cases to not have normal tissue in that field. Because if you remember from the beginning of the seminar, normal tissue doesn't always really like really high doses. We fractionate radiation to try and give that normal tissue time to recover. So it's a way to really reduce the injury to normal tissue. But we now have really specialized planning equipment and delivery equipment that lets us do this safer. Um, so we can give these really high doses if we have a tumor that's really well delineated. So this isn't really meant for a tumor where we can't really make out the edges of the tumor. It's really meant for tumors where, yep, we're sure that we can see the edge of it. We're only gonna treat that gross tumor. So this really isn't a great option if we've removed the tumor with surgery first. So again, just to highlight why SBRT and SRT is really useful, we give a really high dose, an ablative dose of radiation where we're trying to kill everything in that radiation field, but we only do it three or five times. So we really don't treat anything other than the, what we can visibly see as tumor. So this is really designed for well-delineated, ideally small tumors. So here, this is a nasal tumor in a dog. But this is a really atypical, really small nasal tumor. And it's very, very easy to see the margins of that tumor that are outlined in blue right there. So these are just three other examples where I'm showing you a dose color wash. So this is that same image that you've already seen with a dog with a sarcoma on the rib. 
This is a dog with a nasal tumor where you can see that the dose is able to sculpt around the critical sensitive structures within the eye. This has drastically changed the toxicity profile for the patients that see us um, for nasal tumors. So dogs and cats that come and see us with nasal tumors, we used to say, well, about 80 or 90% of patients would have some degree of ocular toxicity. They might have some dry eye or they may develop a cataract. And now we have reduced that to probably probably less than 20% with our current protocols. And then this is a cat actually with a really, really tiny pituitary tumor. So cats are really unique because their body sizes are so small that we have to be very careful about how much normal tissue um, is involved in that plan. And so what I wanted to just depict here is that these three treatments, you know, we're conforming to the tumor in all of these cases, but I'm using completely different planning techniques in all of these cases. And ultimately, it's really about coming up with the plan that best suits that particular pet in that particular tumor. So when the plan is finished, everyone gets really excited. I've come up with this great computer plan. We're so excited to use this. The problem is it's not done yet. Um, so before we get the pet in and we're ready to treat the pet, um, we actually need it to be checked first. This is hours of a process. So the contouring typically takes hours for every patient. The planning can take anywhere between six to 15 hours of dedicated planning time. Um, so this is a lot of work that goes into this point, but we don't want the pet to come in for treatment unless we're 100% sure that the computer plan is right. We have to make sure that whatever the computer says we can do, that when we take it over to the LINAC, the LINAC does what we want it to do. And so we have our physics group come over and they'll actually check the plan. They'll actually measure it and make sure that the plan is doing what we expect it to do. Once they give us the, that, yes, the plan has passed, then we call the owner and we say, great, we're all ready to go, we'll have you come in. And so one of the, the, the privileges that I have working here is that I work with some incredible technicians. And our goal in radiation oncology is really to have the pets want to come and see us every day. We do not want this to be a traumatic process for the client or the pet. Um, and so what we do is we really get to know the pets. And that might mean we do some playtime before each treatment. Um, it might mean, in this dog's case, maybe a little TLC and a little snuggle time. We have a big toy box that's downstairs in our vault area. So this is our vault area where our treatment machine is. This big toy box typically gets upended early in the day and we've got toys strewn everywhere. But this is an opportunity to really reduce anxiety for the patients that come in to see us. Um, and a lot of our pets are like this, where they come in and it's ball time and it's play time before treatment. And this creates a really positive environment. Um, and it's fun for us as well because we get to know our patients really well. So once we have our computer system, you know, make the plan. We've had our physics check the plan. We've played with our patient. We're ready to start treatment. But how do we make sure that that plan is actually delivered properly? And I think this is one of the scariest things for owners. You know, we're creating these positions and we need our pets to be in those exact same positions for treatment. And so we need the use of anesthesia to make sure that our pet is positioned properly and stays in that position properly. So in human oncology, you can say, okay, hold still for the next 10 to 15 minutes while we image you and then we treat you. We really can't do that with our patients. And so we do use anesthesia, but we use a lighter plane of anesthesia versus something like a surgery. There's nothing that we're doing that's particularly invasive. We're positioning the pet, but then we're not really doing anything painful. So we can keep them at a relatively light plane. And the way that, the, that our radiation oncology service works is that every pet is assigned a radiation therapist who's just responsible for positioning the pet and making sure that the plan is given appropriately. The pet is also assigned an anesthetist, and that's one of our dedicated radiation therapy technicians whose only job is to make sure that anesthesia goes according to plan. We have a dedicated anesthesia service here, and our our anesthetist actually rounds with our anesthesia department every day. We also 
like to say that we have open communication, meaning that we really listen to the client when you come in and you say, hey, last night, you know, Fluffy was kind of tired. She really wasn't up and she wasn't eating as much. I'd like to try something different. You know, our goal is to try and keep our patients feeling great at home. And we really don't want our patients sedated and not their normal selves in the evenings. We can't always make it perfect, but we're certainly willing to try. Um, but I think anesthesia is probably one of the scariest things for people. Um, and we're very direct. You know, if we have patients that have um, pre existing conditions that might make anesthesia worrisome, we address those up front. And so once we have our patient positioned and they're anesthetized, we take it one step further because why stop there? Um, we really want to make sure that that tumor is in the right position. And so we also do what's called image guided radiation therapy here. And this is positioning verification to make sure that before we beam on with radiation, we're really, really sure that our tumor is where it needs to be. This lets us give really precise and accurate treatment. And this is one of the reasons we can now give something like stereotactic radiation therapy, where we're giving really high doses, we have to know that the tumor is actually in the right location. So this is actually a dog that's laying on her left side and we're treating an anal sac tumor in this dog. And what you're going to see is two CT scans here. This purple one is actually kind of the gold standard. That's the CT we used for the radiation plan. The green is actually a, a CT that we get before treatment. So we have a, a CT scanner that's built onto the linear accelerator. It's not used for diagnostic purposes, but it can be used for positioning. And as I start this video, you'll see that we're looking for changes between the purple and the green. So where you can see the little areas of purple, that's where there's a slight mismatch in the imaging. And we can actually match the image for the pets and we can make those shifts on the pets for the day to force basically that tumor to be where we need it to be. This gives us that confidence that our plan is going to be accurate for the tumor. So you can see here I'm sliding. This is the radiation plan. This is the positioning CT. And as we're sliding like that, you can see that we're overlaying the bones. And this is what's giving us that positioning verification. Our target is sitting in this kind of red region right in here. So because we know our bones are really well aligned, this is the large intestine right here that's aligned. We know that we can beam on with confidence. We're not treating anything that we don't expect to be treating. So then regardless of if our patients are inpatients or outpatients, um, we like to do a little bit of TLC after treatment. So that might mean taking advantage of some post anesthesia munchies. Some pets really just want nap time. So you can see she's sleeping on the lap of one of our technicians. Um, and some of our pets just want a little bit of snuggle time after radiation therapy. Um, so again, we're all about trying to make this as, as relaxing an experience as we can for the pets that want to see us. So again, I think anesthesia is probably one of the scariest things, but certainly um, radiation toxicity is a real thing. Um, I haven't put a lot of radiation toxicity in here because it's so unique to the pet and so unique to the plan. Um, what our goal is, is to have every patient like this at home. So we want them to be doing the things that bring them the absolute most joy in their lives. Um, but mo we can get side effects that are predominantly cosmetic. Um, but these, this is a skin burn from radiation in a surgical site. This is a dog that has some dry scaling in her radiation field. She's also obviously lost the hair in her radiation field. Um, these sometimes do require a buster collar for a short period of time after radiation. Um, but these are typically reversible effects. We go through all of this information ahead of time. And again, it's just very unique to the tumor that it's hard to generalize what toxicities we might have. But we walk you through the whole step of, of any adverse events that might come up. Luckily for us, we don't tend to have a lot of really serious side effects after radiation. Um, we tend to have a fair number of aesthetic changes in the radiation field. So this is a cat that was treated for an injection site sarcoma over her thorax. And you can see that she used to be black. She now has this radiation field that's outlined in white. So sometimes the hair will be gone and then it will regrow white. 
This is a dog who, because of her breed, she did lose her hair coat over her nasal tumor, um, but you can see that she still has hair around her eyes. So we were able to sculpt the radiation dose around her eyes. And here's a dog that was treated for a mast cell tumor over his muzzle. And again, you can see that he's got some white hair coat. Um, I kind of don't mind this because it's a cancer survivor symbol. You know, these are heroes, certainly of the veterinary world. Um, and it kind of shows you that we've treated the thing that we've said that we've treated. So when radiation treatments are finished, everyone again gets really excited. We don't ring a bell here, because it's a little disruptive for some of the patients, um, but we do a lot of celebrations within the oncology service. Um, a lot of our patients will pick a toy to go home with, some will go home with um, some bandanas or a, a little bow tie. So we do like to celebrate these wins, um, but that doesn't mean we don't wanna see the pet back. So we still wanna see the patients back. Um, we typically will try to have our patients come back one and two weeks after radiation treatment treatments, and then periodically after this time period. And the reason for this is that we're constantly evaluating our protocols and our patient outcomes. We're so excited by all of these new technologies, but we want to make sure that these new technologies are providing better outcomes and lower toxicities. Are there things that we can do to to improve some of those things. And so it's really important that we get information about how well did radiation work for this particular tumor? Did we have any unexpected toxicities? How satisfied was the client with the treatment? Are there anything that we, is there anything we can do to improve the experience? You know, we're constantly going back to try and look at ways that we can improve our care. For some cases, we can't actually see the tumor externally. Um, so for example, in a nasal tumor in a patient, um, again, CT is going to provide us the most information because we can't see externally where the tumor is. In this example, we've got the eyes sitting here, the lower jaw is here. This is the air-filled nasal cavity. So this is what this should look like. And there's a big tumor that's sitting right next to the brain. The only way we can know with certainty that that tumor is gone is to re-image. We can sometimes use clinical signs to say, well, the clinical signs are improved, so we think the tumor is better. We're academicians here. We want to know that the tumor is better. This kind of information can really help us change you know, how we alter protocols going forward. And then I'll leave you just in the last minute with some of the impact of these newer technologies. And I have a question mark there because some of this we don't really know yet. We're still gathering information. IMRT and SBRT are still relatively new in veterinary medicine. Um, and our literature is just now starting to come out with you know, things that are looking good and things that maybe we could improve on. Certainly some of the advantages, we can treat more tumors. We have so many different options now for pets with tumors that it's really uncommon that we would say we can't treat a particular patient. If we say we can't treat, it's usually because we don't think it will help the pet, not because we can't do it. We have better localization so we can target our tumors better. Because we can target our tumors better, we can actually reduce the amount of normal tissue that's near the radiation field, and that will reduce toxicity. And then some of these newer technologies like SBRT will actually decrease the overall treatment time. Again, it's not always an option for every pet. With some of these advantages, you know, newer technology, new software, increased number of people that are needed to try and make sure that these plans are going as smoothly and as quickly as possible. Um, there is an increased cost associated with IMRT and SBRT. Um, there's increased maintenance. So it's kind of like having an expensive car. Sometimes the parts are really expensive to replace. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes that does mean increased anesthesia time. Um, we are actually in the in the process of hopefully upgrading some of the hardware and software here in the next couple of years. Um, so we're really hoping that one of the main things we can do is actually decrease anesthesia time and treat even more pets with tumors. And with that, I'd like to just Thank you from all of the radiation oncology and medical oncology team. Um, we, you know, this is what motivates us. We're here for the pets. We love the pets that we see and that we that we treat. We love to treat all of the pets um, that that you know, need treatment for cancer. I'd like to do a special shout out just to the radiation therapy technicians as well. It's been a bit of a, a migrating team, but they 
kind of like upstairs, they are the heart and the soul of radiation oncology. Um, they make it a joy to come to work every day and they love what they do. And I can, I can promise that they are um, pretty much in love with all of the patients that are downstairs and um, interacting with us. And this is just what the radiation oncology website looks like. Um, again, we're integrated with medical oncology. And if you go to the VMC website, this is a work in progress, um, but we do have some client information sheets up there. Um, we have a separate sub page here that's with radiation therapy alone. And it kind of walks through a lot of what we've gone through tonight, which is what is radiation therapy? What types of tumors can we treat with radiation therapy? And then it kind of walks through a little bit about the different planning techniques. And then with that, I will turn the controls back over to Lauren. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we're at time, but I do want to, we had some great questions, so I do want to take a few of them quickly. Um, but it's a great presentation and a lot of um, good questions coming in. So, so one that we had is, are there areas on a dog or cat where radiation cannot be performed? Yeah, and that's, that's a great question. Historically, I would have said there are some deep-seated tumors in the abdomen that we really struggle to treat. Um, but now with new advanced equipment and new advanced software, again, it's very rare that we can't treat something. The only times I would say that we really struggle is size. Um, and it's one of the things that we stress to, you know, the DVM students that are here is that the earlier we can detect tumors, generally the better we can treat them. Um, the radiation therapy units, you know, they're a set size. We can only treat something that's like a 40 by 40 centimeter field. That seems huge, um, but unfortunately we do see some tumors that exceed that length. That's where we may struggle. But again, even in those situations, the answer is not no. Um, I, I work with an incredible group of medical physicists and radiation oncologists at the medical school. Um, they can help us with really complicated treatments that may be larger than what our machine is normally capable of giving or administering. Great question. Sure. Um, and then obviously this is very complex and technical. So a few people asked a question um, related to cost. So would you be able to discuss some of the estimated costs associated with different levels of treatment? Yes, absolutely. And, and certainly we, we know that radiation therapy is expensive. The equipment is expensive um, and all the people that are involved, um, you know, it's a lot of work. Um, currently, so we're always evaluating our costs, but currently um, a palliative intent type of protocol um, where we're only kind of really looking to improve quality of life. Um, typically it's only a few treatments is typically about five to $6,000. That does include the CT scan that we would use for the planning. Not all patients will need a CT scan, but the majority of our patients will get a CT scan as part of their radiation protocol. If we don't use a CT, it's still about four to $5,000 for radiation. For a definitive type of protocol, and that's regardless of if we're trying to get long-term control using kind of smaller doses of radiation every day, or some sort of the more sophisticated SBRT type treatments where we're giving a big dose, it can be about 10 to $12,000 for treatment. So it's certainly no joke, it's a lot of money. And it's why we wanna make sure that you're really comfortable moving forward when we talk about it at that first visit. I would also stress um, insurance companies will sometimes pay for radiation. So it's one thing I always encourage clients um, to just look at some of the riders if they happen to have insurance, um, see if it covers oncology treatments that can sometimes offset the cost. Um, and then the only other thing I would mention is we do, you know, that doesn't include any of the costs associated with diagnosis or staging. Um, so we are realists, you know, some, some cases of, of cats and dogs with tumors will sometimes cost 15 to $20,000 by the time you add in a diagnosis, a surgery and radiation. Um, so we do recognize it's, it's certainly expensive. Sure. All right. Let's take one more question um, because maybe it relates to that in a sense. Um, what questions should owners ask themselves um, and the treatment for provider to make the best treatment choice for their pet? Yeah, and this is a really 
This is a really great question, and it's one that's really hard to answer and generalize for everybody. But what I would encourage every client to do when they're trying, these are complicated decisions, um, and we know that. So one, we want you to feel like you can ask us any question, and we will be blunt with you. So whether that's, you know, would you do this with your own pets? We hate that question, but we'll answer the question. For me, what it generally comes down to is not so much about what do you want to do? Sometimes the easier question is, hey, at the end of the day, will you regret not treating or will you regret treating? And most clients find that to be an easier question to answer than, oh, which is the best option to do? Um, and I usually share my own experience that, you know, the love of my, the canine love of my life that I've had, that I used to have, um, I said his whole life, I would never treat him for cancer. He wasn't the right demeanor. I just wouldn't do that to him and he would be miserable coming in. He ended up getting cancer and I did everything. And you don't always know what you'll do until you actually have that discussion with your oncologist. And I would also tell folks that, you know, whatever you decide on that first day, um, if you decide to treat or you decide not to treat, don't regret that decision. Don't second guess that decision. If you decide not to treat at the moment, treatment might be still an option later on down the line. If you decide to treat, it's really hard to take that away. So we wanna kind of encourage you to go with your gut decisions. Um, and we're here to help you. And our goal is not to judge. We will help clients that choose no treatment. You know, Our goal is really just to try and maintain good quality of life and maintain that excellent bond that you have with your pets. You're not here because you don't love your pet. You're here because they're a valued member of your family and because you have a really strong bond. And I think what one of the hardest things in, to be a pet owner is, is that your pet's not talking to you. They can't tell you what they want or what they don't want. You're, you're taking this decision for them and making it. Um, and that comes with a lot of guilt. <laughs> Sure. I don't know if that really answered that question, but we no, do know it that it's really hard. It did. Yeah. Well, um, thank you so much, Dr. Lawrence, for an excellent presentation. Um, and thank you to our many participants that shared such thoughtful questions in advance and during the presentation. Um, as always, the VMC is here for you 24-7 to help care for your pet. So please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and if you enjoy learning about our team's work tonight, we do encourage you to visit our website or reach out to us directly to learn more about our mission to improve the health and well-being of animals and people. And we hope you will consider uh, supporting our oncology service through philanthropy. Gifts do play a critical role in expanding our work. And we thank everyone joining us tonight who does support the Lewis Small Animal Hospital. Um, we hope to see you next month on December 8th when Dr. Tracy Hill will lead a presentation highlighting cutting edge interventional radiology treatment for pets. So thank you again for attending tonight and have a wonderful evening, everyone.